This is Camilla Mahan. I'm Charlie Lloyd. We're from Mapbox, and we're going to talk about pixels at scale. Uh, just to give you a quick idea of the arc of this talk, because um, it's going to be a little long, we're going to start with an intro that's just going to set the stage. Um, Camilla's going to talk about ingestion, where we get imagery from, how we pull it in. I'm going to talk a little about processing, what we do, it, do to it once we get it. Um, and then we'll just put a little conclusion on that. So a reasonable question is, why do we make a satellite-based map at Mapbox? Theoretically, we could just go and buy some product, right? There are other base maps. We don't have to do all this work necessarily. Um, and I think there are two non-obvious answers. One is Mapbox knows scale. We started as a tile-serving company that renders OpenStreetMap constantly, right? We have DevOps people who do amazing things with these huge data sets. Uh, to them, the idea of taking a global data set and doing something with it every five minutes is just not scary. When I showed up at Mapbox, I was like, hey, so I have this like image processing algorithm that I've been doing on my laptop, which has four cores. Um, I'm just curious, like, do we have the budget or like know how to ramp this up to like a workstation with 16 cores or something? And they didn't laugh to their credit. Um, that, and then they showed me what we did at the time, which was to launch hundreds and hundreds of EC2 nodes um, of like 16 cores each, all in one linked Tmux session. So you would type simultaneously into all of them at once. Uh, we have slightly more mature systems now. <laughs> And second, Mapbox knows open. Um, we make many open source products, but we also know how to consume open data. Uh, as I suspect everyone here knows, open data is not easy. Um, any data set has data problems. Open data, often you get better results at the end, but you have to do a certain amount of work to clean it, understand it, make it useful. Uh, an example of that is feeding uh, this imagery that we get back into the open community. So this is commercial imagery that we opened up for uh, OpenStreetMap tracing, which is really unusual, and I'm, I'm really proud that we got to do that. So one of the themes here is going to be scale. We're not always going to bring it up explicitly, but I hope that you'll understand that when we talk about doing something, we mean doing it often to the entire world. Um, Earth has 1.5 times 10 to the 14th square meters of land. That's 150 trillion one meter pixels. The continental US alone is 8 trillion one meter pixels. So if you're doing processing and you can process at one gigapixel per second, that's going to take you 40 hours. But one gigapixel per second is three gigabytes of 8-bit TIFF per second, which is like as fast as a typical disk can read it. Like that's, that's where you start, and that's a work week on a single core. And if you go down to quarter meter, or what we've got now from Digital Globe, this like 30 centimeter stuff, times nine. And that's to do nothing. If you want to do something more sophisticated, that just multiplies out. So if we're doing this at scale, and we're using open data, we have to work with a lot of different image resources which means we have fun problems. Camilla will get more into this, but I just want to give you a very quick tour of what our base map looks like and where this comes from. Uh, out here at low zoom levels, this is NASA data that we downloaded two years worth of and processed to remove clouds and seams and all kinds of image artifacts. Uh, if we skip a couple of zoom levels at a time and just pop in further, still NASA, NASA, this is Landsat from USGS. This is a satellite system that's been running since the early 70s, um, collecting scientific data. But as the sensors got better and better, you could go from uh, science quality data to visual quality data. Now, mostly we think of science quality as being uh, a higher standard and visible, like just RGB 8-bit stuff, as being lower. But often it's the other way around. Often 
when you want something that looks perfect, it has to have no seams, no noise, none of all these little problems that in like a scientific paper, you can work around, you can average out, you can show how you dealt with them and so on. But if you're making a base map, it just has to look right. And sometimes that's harder than getting it to be right. This is Adelaide, Australia, one of my favorite cities from space. It abuts these big um, hills where there were just some, some kind of horrible wildfires. Uh, and then around the downtown core, there's, there's this little green belt. That was the original downtown. And then as you get in here to the sort of seeing buildings levels, um, this is from Digital Globe. And there's just some people having their weekend cricket matches. So what's really impressive to me about this kind of zoom is not just the number of pixels at high resolution here, right? The fact that there are 150 trillion of these. It's the ratio between this scale and this scale. So this is zoom level three. This is zoom level 19. That's 16 zoom levels. So a single pixel here is 65,000 by 65,000 pixels here, because that's 2 to the 16th. And it's that range, as much as the actual size of the data sets, that causes a lot of fun problems. I just like looking at images of Earth. Um, so I'd say I landed in a pretty good job. Uh, this is basically backwoods Brazil. This is like the Brazil equivalent of Kentucky. It's a place I would never think about if I hadn't come across an image of it. This is Earth. It looks like Mars, but it's Earth. This is Namibia. That's a volcano that exploded millions and millions of years ago. Here's some glaciers in Antarctica. Antarctica and Greenland are huge. You don't think about them, but if you're making a base map, then you think about them because you want to have something there, right? Like. You don't just want to leave a, a blank space. This is one of my favorite pictures of Earth. Uh, this is the Kaponda Dam in Angola. And what I like about it is how it shows all these different processes of change. So the dam is new. A few years ago, the lake level was much lower. You know, it's backed up behind the dam to create pressure for uh, hydropower. Uh, the, many of the roads are new. Some of the roads you can barely see on the projector here are old. They're abandoned. They're fading out and turning back into wilderness. We've got seasonal change out in the wilderness. We've got agriculture here. Those fields will be a different color in a week and a very different color in a couple months. And of course, this agricultural fire where they're burning off like a fallow field. All of these processes are happening all the time everywhere, right? There's nowhere on Earth that's static. So a base map is not a fixed thing. It's not a picture of Earth, because that only, that only works at one instant. You know, um, It's a constantly changing and evolving thing. It's living. And that's what Camilla's going to talk about. All right. Hi. Um, is that coming through? Cool. All right. Great. Uh, so Charlie talked a lot about um, just kind of like the basics of the base map. Um, he talked a little bit about the sources. Uh, he touched on us using NASA, MODIS, Landsat, and Digital Globe. Um, and those are just a few of the many sources that we ingest into our base map. Um, so some of the other examples of what we use uh, are mostly coming from open data sources. So these are coming from regional governments. Um, in the US, we use something from the USDA called NAEP, the National Agricultural In Inventory Program. And I'll give you some examples of other um, openly licensed imagery data sets that we also use in our base map. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we find that data, 
how we acquire it, um, what some of the processing quirks are, what we have to do in terms of data discovery so that we can like um, appropriately deal with metadata and normalize across all of our sources. Uh, and then we'll kind of cover the rest of stitching and turning into web mercator tiles and publishing to the web. So first, talking about imagery ingestion um, and actually going out and finding the data. Uh, this is um, really time consuming sometimes, right? Uh, you can talk about kind of the open data desert. Uh, so we go out and we really want to use openly licensed sources, um, but they are really hard to find. Um, and oftentimes they're stored um, in websites that are in other languages. Um, these are government websites that are not easy to navigate anyway. Um, and so going out and finding that uh, can really be a pain. Um, sometimes we go and look for a source for a country, like, right? We want the, um, the equivalent to the National Agricultural Inventory Program data collection in the US. Say we want it for France, maybe it just doesn't exist. Um, and then other times we find imagery and it makes us really happy and then we get to process it. Um, and so uh, just a couple examples of some of the um, sources that we have touched recently. So again, um, not to harp on it, but the National Agricultural Inventory Program is a really wonderful open data source for imagery in the United States. Um, this is aerial flyovers of every state at the height of the growing season, and the data is not more than like three or five years old. Um, so, and that's all, all imagery that your tax dollars are paying for. Um, and so this is something that we feel really good about spending the time to ingest and process and push back out to the public. Um, in other places, uh, like Canada, they don't have uh, a single source for that. It's more on a regional or city basis. So um, just a couple of the cities that have these open data programs that we're able to ingest from. Um, Germany, again, it's uh, kind of on a city by city basis. New Zealand, we got a whole bunch of imagery. South Africa also. Um, Denmark, we got the whole country in one fell swoop, Finland. Italy, cities again, France, cities, Belgium, we got the whole Flanders region, which is all of northern Belgium. But you can see that, um, again, like our sources are very numerous and very diverse. And the way that it's split up and packaged is like all over the map. Um, sometimes we're scraping web, map, web, map, web mapping services or WMS, WMTS, web map tile services. Uh, sometimes we are uh, coming into really nice, nicely formatted websites where you have a click for each ortho photo that you want to download, and that's pretty easy to write um, a little scraper for in Bash or Python or whatever you want to do. Um, sometimes we have these really beautiful UIs that we get to click through and discover data from. Um, so this is, I believe, Toulouse in France. Um, so not as easy as kind of like a single click and download, a little bit harder to write a scraper for, um, but you know, that's just kind of part of what we do. Um, and then <laughs> one of my favorite ways uh, that we found imagery stored is in a linked PDF. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's really awesome. We found a lot of these uh, on the Canadian websites, actually. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And the thing about it is, yeah, like, it's kind of, um, you know, it's funny, all these different sources, but at the end of the day, we just sit down and we type and we put together these scrapers and the imagery is there and that's so much better than it not being there. Um, and that makes us really happy. And so once we have the data, we kind of have to go in deeper and figure out like what are the quirks that we have to deal with, right? So we're going to dive in uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about processing now. Our sources are numerous and diverse. Keep that in mind. So all of these things that we're building, like Charlie was saying, we're building them um, for a really big scale, right? Like big, big pipelines. And then we're also dealing with a lot of different um, versions of the same problem. So when we're writing tools to identify problems or characteristics of a certain problem, we need to kind of like cast a wide net and then funnel, funnel down um, into smaller bins that we can then take care of. Uh, so some of the issues or some of the characteristics of data uh, and imagery are projections, no data regions, um, the way the files are actually stored, compressed, uncompressed, lossy compression, non-lossy compression, and then, of course, color. 
Um, so these are some of the things that we need to normalize across all of our imagery so that we can publish it into a single base map. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on talking about no data, um, and it's just because it's a really great uh, visual example of how we can kind of go in and do data discovery um, and like understand the problem that we're dealing with and then write little tools with uh, Python and other open source libraries uh, to deal with uh, normalizing it. Um, so no data. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, Montpellier, France. It's in its native projection. Um, and you see, so this white space is not part of the image. Um, when this image is taken from its regular UTM projection and put into a web mercator projection, you can see it kind of like gets turned a little bit and you have these black lines on either side of the image that are the no data region. And so that's just the part of the image that should be set to transparent when it hits the base map. Um, when you don't set that to transparent, your imagery ends up looking really, really ugly, right? You don't get the end product that you want at all. Um, so properly setting that no data value has been like a really big task for us because the no data value changes from source to source, right? We've seen anything from 255, 255, 255, which is white, to zeros, to like funky blue colors and green. Um, I'll show you an example later where uh, in one source the people who processed the image initially wanted to match the no data color to the water in the image, which is like <laughs> kind of a good idea for like a very specific purpose, but for us it was like, you know, how do you even know to look for that? Um, so um, one of the ways that we go about looking for these types of issues in images is to just do some um, like poking into what the image looks like in a histogram. So I'm going to talk you guys through um, just like histograms and how they can um, help identify some of these issues. So in an uh, image that has no no data, you can look at all of the values in that image. And uh, the frequency is really low. And the distribution across all of the uh, potential values in an 8-bit image uh, are reasonably spread, right? Here's an image that has a huge no data section. Um, and you can imagine for the valid da data pixels in that bottom corner, um, the distribution is going to be very similar to the previous image that I showed you. But then we should see a really big spike in this 255 region. And that's exactly what you get, right? So you can you can identify some of these weird quirks in your images just by doing a little bit of discovery. And this is all stuff that you can do in NumPy and the SciPy stack. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that easy with every image that comes through your pipeline, right? So you can have images that have this like tiny little piece of no data or like that original image that gets reprojected and you just have those tiny little slices on either end. Um, it's like, well, if it's not going to stand out that much in the image, how am I going to find it? Um, and so what you can see here is that typically those values still stand out anyway, but they compete with the rest of the peak in the values in the image. Right? So um, finding like a second characteristic uh, is super useful when you're trying to identify uh, something funky like no data. So in this instance, we can see that the normal pixels in the image are surrounded by a really nice distribution, whereas the no data values like fall off right after that zero value. And so that's just another thing that you can build into the logic of your pipeline to um, like isolate one problem or another. Um, something else you can do is think about your problems in terms of like how do you see them with your own eyes. So when we're looking at this no data value, we see that it's one consistent value, right? And it's really easy for us to identify it because we, we can recognize consistency. And so if you take out all of the non-consistent pixels in your image and you're working with just um, pixels that are the same exact value one next to the other, you can get rid of a lot of variation and you can find that no data value like right on its own and it sticks out. This is the uh, funky blue situation I was talking about. This was, I think, Denmark's imagery. Um, and so you can see how um, one source, bunch of different uh, no data values uh, can be kind of a pain unless you are able to automate some of these processes and write tests so that you can kind of bin your imagery one way or another and then do the processing that you need to kind of nullify that issue. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why packaging matters. Um, so this has to do with like compression and um, like no data values are one thing, but um, you know projections and and all these other funky things uh, are affected by the way your image is packaged. So um, one of the things that we see also coming up in no data values is something that you see with uh, imagery that's stored in a um, loss in a lossy way. So we see a lot of ECW files coming through, uh, JPEG 2000s. Um, these are all compressed storage formats. And essentially, when you store something in a compressed way that's lossy compression, your input and output are going to be different. Um, and so one of the ways that that manifests itself is these little artifacts. And we found that it really affects the no data regions um, by giving kind of like slightly mixed pixel values. And so, what do you call oh, we call these, <laughs> we started calling these mouse bites. It kind of looks like when a mouse goes in, like choose the edge of your cereal box. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it does need a GIF. I had more, but we had to cut them down. Um, <laughs> uh, so, right. So this is this is another um, this is another one of those things that you can kind of write test test to find. Um, you just have to figure out what the right characteristic <coughs> is for us, or is in order to identify that. So. Um, we kind of said to ourselves, is this something that we can write a similar test for to the way that we did for the rest of the no data values? And um, the answer is, OK, this is, these are just some more examples of the lossy compressed uh, artifacts. So it can be really, really widespread. Like This is super disgusting. And when this shows up in your base map, it looks like this if you haven't identified it. Because you're patching like one image on top of another, and like when we first saw this, we were like, "What the, like what, what's going on here?" We thought that was like a totally nice image, um, and you know, soon we discovered this compression issue, um, and kind of said, "You know, how do we solve this? Can we can we use some of the similar methods that we were using to identify the rest of the new data to um, to deal with this as well?" Um, The answer is totally. Yeah, you definitely can. <laughs> There's the GIF. <laughs> Glad you liked that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so back to our histograms. Um, when you go when you go back to these graphs, you can see that those lossy values can kind of be captured in the same um, in the same discovery phase, right? So you have that large. Um, no data value spike, and then if you know that that exists, you can really easily look for neighboring values that might be those mixed pixels, uh, identify those, and also like, trash them. Um, really easy to find if you know what you're looking for. And so we were able to nullify that issue pretty quickly once we were able to identify it. I'm going to hand back to Charlie, talk a little bit more about um, tools and libraries that we use. Um, and color. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> so this section of the talk was originally named something like tools and libraries that we use. Um, but then I wrote it, and it was basically just a love letter to Rasterio. So that's what it is now. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know of Rasterio or use it, or both. Um, but for those who don't, let me step back just a moment to talk about where, what it comes out of. GDAL is great. I see Frank there nodding. <laughs> Let's see if we're still friends at the end of this. GDAL is the core of virtually every geo library or tool that people here are using, right? It, it's just, it's monumental. Like it's just dominant in the open source geo space um, and should be. It's open, it's reliable, it's fast, and it's featureful. Each of these matters. Each of these is vital. If it were only three of these things, I wouldn't care about GDAL. All four is terrific. It's not super friendly, not out of the box. <laughs> and some of that is just the intrinsic difficulty of the problems it's solving, right? There's no, there's no way to make like, um, you know, weird projections conceptually easy. It's just, it's, it's a hard problem. That's fine. 
there are things that kind of chafe a bit. The example I like to use when I'm teaching someone about GDAL uh, is that the three GDAL tools on the command line that I use the most aren't even consistently named among themselves. Like the binaries are not consistently named. We've got no space, we've got underscore, we've got underscore dot pi. GDAL build VRT takes arguments in the opposite order from GDAL warp. I step in this like once a day. <laughs> I, I build a VRT, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is possible to overstate <laughs> how frustrating and like weird this gets. <laughs> but it goes a little bit deeper where like if you look at the um, the example code uh, for like how to use GDAL in various languages. Um, the C version is like totally Byzantine and weird and you're constantly like freeing pointers or whatever it is you do in C. Um, and the Python version is relatively clean. But like as a Python programmer, you look at this and you have certain reactions. This works, it's not the most conventional idiomatic code. Um, constant values, uh, uh, exception system that's kind of C-like versus Python-like. Um, it, it works, like I've written things in the raw GL bindings and it's, it's, it lets me do things I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, so, when I get frustrated with it, I remind myself it's open. You can reuse it. You can, you can do whatever you want with it, basically, within the terms of the license. <laughs> so I tinkered with various things with it for a long time and then uh, went to Sean Gillies. Um, please keep your cheering down to a dull roar. Um, and was like, hey, Sean, like, it'd be kind of cool if we could do this and that and the other. And Sean was like, hmm, OK, and then wrote it that night. Um, <laughs> And called it Rasterio, which we pronounce that way because we're contrary. Um, and all it is is a clean Python interface to GDAL. It's not a replacement for GDAL. It doesn't, it doesn't undo anything GDAL does. It's just a clean interface, just a simple way of making bridges between Python and GDAL because we love both those things. Really, it's just about lowering friction. So we can talk about scale in terms of like, hundreds of processing nodes and uh, you know gigabytes of imagery per second and so on. Um, but as a programmer, I think the main way that you actually interact with scaling is in what you're able to imagine, what you're able to develop, um, what you can do easily, like what you can do because you got an idea without having to add a bunch of overhead. This is how you open a file in Rosario. Uh, and read three bands out of it and copy the metadata. It looks like Python, right? Like you don't know that you're working with a C library here. You don't have to think the way those people think. <laughs> <laughs> this is a slightly more complicated example. Um, who here has heard of NDVI? Okay, good. Bunch of nerds. Um, <laughs> NDVI is a, a very simple um, piece of math that you use in remote sensing all the time uh, that estimates essentially how healthy plants are by looking at uh, red light and near infrared light and just computes this little normalized ratio. Um, it's very simple, but if you look at how NDVI is actually implemented in the world, it tends to be one of two ways. Either it's a graphical tool with a push button or it's a script that's really long because it has to do all this overhead and like read the band in, read the other band in, make sure that they're what you expect them to be, you know, do the ratio, etc. cetera. Um, with Rasterio and NumPy, which I'm about to get to, it's very, very simple. The NDVI calculation is line 17 and it looks exactly like the formula on Wikipedia. The other stuff is mostly just about being adaptable to different input uh, bit depths, like 8-bit versus 16-bit, and doing that scaling automatically. Um, there's not a lot of bloat here. Like, it just, it just does the thing, um, which is easy to take for granted until you try to do it another way. So 
Rasterio is really a bridge from GDAL to NumPy. NumPy is a Python array programming library that interfaces with SciPy and all these other Python toolkits. Um, and it's where we do everything cool. It's also where <laughs> all the bugs appear. <laughs> An example of a bug <laughs> is the Blood River. So we were processing NAPE, which Camilla mentioned, uh, and to make it consistent enough to blend smoothly, we had to match it against a Landsat reference layer. Because Landsat is very well calibrated, but it's not very high resolution. Um, so we could kind of use histogram matching to combine strengths of NAPE and Landsat and make something that was Landsat colored, but NAPE resolution. Uh, so you've got Landsat on the left, NAPE in the middle, and this thing I don't want to talk about on the right. <laughs> Where what we've tried to do is tell this NAPE Okay, you have to look like that Landsat. You have to shift your histograms around until you are basically that color. And what we found is in some cases where there was water especially, it would just diverge and we would get these weird red pools of water. And it was gross and eerie and we all felt like, ah. um, <laughs> which was a huge pain in the neck and took a long time to discover because it didn't happen very often. Um, and then we had to figure out why it was throwing history and matching off. To figure that out, we could just look in our pipeline. And this is why open tools matter. This is why Rosario matters, um, among other reasons. This sequence here along the bottom is just something we could generate automatically for every single NAPE scene that went through the pipeline. Like all of these thousands and thousands and thousands of images covering the entire continental US generated a little page like this, just pulling off S3, parsing some logs, um, and you can see this imagery flow through. It looks a little weird because there are times where like it gets rescaled and so on, so it's not just this like simple march of looking better to better and better. Uh, but all these different things happen to it. And because we could find a Blood River scene and just like look up its number and look in the logs and see what had happened to it in this like open way, no black boxes, no mystery button, no nothing. Um, we could narrow in on the problem really fast and write little you know, one line changes here and there and see that it was working. Um, one thing we did in this pipeline that you might not be able to read is deperping. It's the second to last step. This was something we did to NAEP because when you look at raw nape, you see this kind of purple fringe effect where there's a really bright surface next to a really dark surface. So these are uh, apartment blocks next to uh, or, um, evergreen trees and shadows. This is the same effect that you get if you take like a, like a phone picture of a skylight. You'll see this sort of purple fringe around the edge of the skylight. And it's because there's ultraviolet light that's out of focus because the camera is trying to focus on the RGB light. Um, and it's accidentally a little bit sensitive to you because you can't really filter it out without also filtering out blue. And this happens in NAPE. It doesn't really happen in most other imagery because NAPE is taken in odd ways. The USDA basically gave, this, gave the states a mandate to take it. And they, in some cases, flew what amount to just high-end DSLRs like strapped to the bottom of a plane. Um, which worked. Like, I'm not complaining, but you know, bugs happen. So, what we could do with Rosterio was to look at the places where this happened, these high contrast borders, and look at the very specific shades that this effect took on, like the, the particular hues um, that this would manifest as. It turned out that those colors didn't form a nice, cohesive, area of RGB space. But if we popped into HSV or LCH space, they did. We could define it really well. We could say a pixel in here is very likely to be this purple effect um, if it's in certain contexts and so on. And so we just muted those colors in those contexts, and boom. What was really impressive for me about this, like the my moment of being like, oh, like, hmm, NumPy is pretty special, 
is that we did this to 8 trillion pixels, because that's how many one meter squares there are in the continental US. Um, for every single scene, like everything went through this filter, even if we didn't have any reason to think that it specifically needed it. Um, and we calculated how much it cost us, uh, like upper limit, and it was 50 bucks for the whole US. And I was like, oh, <laughs> we can do pretty weird math with like all these color space conversions and you know bounds checking and this uh, lowering the saturation and then you know converting back and all this kind of Byzantine stuff in NumPy and it's just not significant like we can put that in and it works um, and this was what kind of convinced me that a NumPy pipeline was the only way I wanted to do things. So really, when you break it down, it's just for stereo and NumPy, and they're magic, and they're open source. This is the PSA part of this talk. If you're doing raster processing, if you're doing Geo and Python, and you think you might touch a raster, I really encourage you to look at Rasterio. Um, it makes so many things simpler. It really doesn't get in the way. It just works. It's great. And we would really like your help making it better. We think it has a lot of value for a lot of different people doing a lot of different things in the Python image processing world. Um, and that it's really good enough to bring people into that world, right? Like, Rosario lets you do things that make amazing demos that convince someone, like, oh, this piece of expensive desktop software is not the best solution to my problem. Download with stereo. <laughs> Back to Camilla for a conclusion. All right, so as you can see with um, weird no data values and blood river and deep perp, and all these other weird things that we have to deal with. Um, working with imagery is kind of hard and strange, but it's also hilarious and really fun uh, and beautiful and totally, totally worth it. Um, just think back to some of those images that Charlie showed you at the beginning, and we'll be sure to close with some really beautiful images at the end here, too. Um, open data is super, super important as well. Um, we can't thank the people who contribute to the open, open data ecosystem enough. Um, we really try to ingest as much open data as possible and push that out in our base map because it's an ecosystem that we really believe in. Right? These are products that everyone's tax dollars are paying for anyway, and they're really high quality. And if you can pull them into a single place and publish them and make them accessible, that's um, really valuable. Uh, and so thank you to everybody who contributes to that ecosystem. Rasterio. <laughs> um, we love open source tools. Rasterio is just one of many that we use. Um, NumPy, SciPy, all of that stuff. Um, Shapely, Mercantile, um, you know, all of these libraries. Uh, GDAL, huge, you know. Um, and uh, again, we can't thank the people who contribute to that enough. Um, and we really encourage everybody to try your hand at using those, um, give feedback, ask questions, contribute code. Um, just be part of the community. It's really important. Uh, talking about just kind of the future of, of the space as we see it, um, it's open and it's really high res. Um, that's open in terms of data and tool and high res um, temporally, spatially, and spectral. Um, so, you know, today is the day that more satellites are launching than ever before. And that's a really exciting thing for anybody in the imagery space. Um, you know, we have drones going up too that are collecting um, real-time data for agricultural monitoring and, um, you know, going to do post-disaster uh, response and data collection. Um, everything about that is really exciting and we're just doing our best to try to make that kind of data really accessible um, to anybody who wants to be able to use it. Um, just want to give a quick shout out to uh, some of the people who are here and some of the people who we interact with a lot. NASA, the ESA, Digital Globe, Planet Labs, 
um, Open Drone Map, Astro Digital, um, all of these local and regional GIS departments that are contributing things to the open data ecosystem and the open source ecosystem. Um, everybody on this list and, and many more are innovating every day and really helping us grow the space. Um, and we're just so excited to be part of that and to have um, really uh, you know, smart and, and interesting uh, folks in the space with us. Again, get involved. Um, talk to us, talk to any of those other people that I've mentioned. A lot of them are here at the conference. Um, Frank is here, I uh, see Bronwyn, um, see a lot of other folks that are um, really excited about a lot of these open data sources, open tools, um, share knowledge. Uh, we're just going to close by showing some, um, some images from our open data sources that we've published recently. Um, so this is NAEP again. This is Portland, Oregon. Um, what's that? Just doing all the work. Oh, <laughs> for Portland. Woo, Portland. Um, this is the countryside in Germany. Um, I don't know why I love this so much. It's just like so green and lush. And this is, um, I think, 30 centimeter open data from the German government. Uh, this is downtown uh, Hamburg. Uh, again, really high res stuff, submeter accuracy, all from tax, taxpayer dollars. You can see um, this is from last year. This is a day that some event was happening downtown. You can see this big parade of people kind of coming, going down the water. It's just so, so awesome. This is another countryside picture that I love just because you can sh see the sheep. <laughs> That's just awesome. Cows. You think so? Cows? All right, I won't argue. <laughs> this is Montpellier, France. Um, the colors are just so wonderful. And this is Berlin. Um, also just a gorgeous, gorgeous city, open data. Open data for the win, super cool. Um, thank you again to everybody who contributes. Um, we were thinking that um, there are probably a lot of questions um, and a lot of really smart people in the room. And so um, talk to each other, come talk to us, but we're not gonna take questions on stage because we probably have a lot of things that we could talk about in more depth than what everybody wants to hear. Basically, we would have time for one question because we would go on that one. <laughs> And it's not Frank's. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.